podcast, your source of information and inspiration, as always, to promote the holistic transformation of your health and the health of our planet. Really excited to share this episode this week with a, an amazing woman and mentor of mine, um, someone who's been really just a powerful inspiration in my life and in the life of so many students that she's mentored and taught, as well as the thousands of patients who've, whose lives she's intimately shaped and helped heal. And our guest today is Satya Ambrose. She's an acupuncturist and naturopathic physician. She received a bachelor's in psychology and biochemistry from Evergreen State College in 1975. Her first acupuncture degree from the New England School of Acupuncture in 1976. And she completed yoga teacher training in 1977 and an integrated deep tissue course from Rolfing in 1977 as well. Her second acupuncture degree from the New England School of Acupuncture was in 1978. And finally, she received a naturopathic doctorate from the National College of Naturopathic Medicine in 1989. I think she's had enough schooling at this point, though she continues to teach a lot. She has been practicing for over 30 years. She also has a 24-acre farm where she lives with her husband and three children. She is the co-founder of the Oregon College of Oriental Medicine, where she currently teaches nutrition and biochemistry, as well as pediatrics. She has taught many areas of medicine, including oncology, endocrinology, cardiology, pathology, acupuncture points and therapeutics, medical philosophy, immunology, emotional basis of illness, and women's health. Currently, she focuses on overall prevention of illness She also supervises acupuncture and naturopathic students at the Naturopathic School Clinic. She is currently writing a book about integrating natural and conventional medicine, and she tries to utilize natural therapeutics as well as lifestyle counseling to address patients' symptoms when they come. She believes that patients' pain leads them to discover their physical weakness, which can be countered by changing lifestyle. She also believes that illness can lead to a deeper understanding of self and if addressed appropriately, can prevent potentially fatal illnesses. Illnesses like autoimmune disorders, neurological disease, infection, chronic pain, can all be treated gently and naturally without toxic medications. This approach takes support, encouragement by the physician, and determination on the part of the patient. Overall, the most utilized medicine of all in her practice is love and laughter. I really appreciate Dr. Satya's approach to health and healing and medicine. Of course, it's very much aligned with mine and aligned with, of course, the model of traditional naturopathic medicine. Dr. Satya Ambrose is also collaborating with several colleagues to try and found a hospital which uses integrative care. It's an amazing project. She is also the founder of the nonprofit organization, the Chitari Foundation, which has a vision to create a global model of wellness where all people have access to collaborative medicine. As you can tell, Dr. Satya, what she's doing and what she, her vision that she holds is so aligned with mine and the vision that I believe that many of us in the holistic health and wellness space hold. She is taking incredible action in all of these areas, and it's very inspiring. It was wonderful to connect with her and talk about all of these things that she's doing, health and healing in general, and some powerful stories that she has witnessed over her many years as a naturopathic physician and acupuncturist. One thing that I'm really sorry about in this conversation is that the audio was somewhat imperfect. There was kind of a clicking in the background. I think it has to do with the connection of the microphone, and I'm really sorry about that. Hopefully, it's not too much of an annoyance while listening to this episode. I know it's not perfect, but really the conversation that we shared today was just too powerful and too touching to let go of. Just a reminder for you listeners, please take a moment to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on iTunes, leave a comment on YouTube, or leave some feedback in whatever other way that might be possible. You can also feel free, of course, to visit the website www.altered.health to get some more information about this podcast, about Dr. Satya Ambrose, and about all sorts of other things, of course. So without further ado, why don't we all just sit back, relax, and listen to this conversation with Dr. Satya Ambrose. Welcome. 
welcome to the Alter Your Health podcast. That's oh, the name of the cool. podcast, Satya. Okay. And Dr. Satya Ambrose, I'm really happy to be sitting with you and I've sat with you here in this office times before as an ob observer, kind of a, a preceptor, a preceptee, watching your magic, <laughs> along with hundreds, maybe a thousand of students over the years. I don't know how many have yeah, been through the office. Oh gosh, I don't know. Never thought of yeah. that. Yeah, but you, you're definitely a, a, uh, a rock star precepti, or preceptor teaching a lot of uh, naturopathic doctors over the years and Chinese medicine doctors. So, yeah, welcome. Well, thank you. So what do you want to know? <laughs> I want to know everything that you know. Oh, gosh, okay. And I want to know it now. <laughs> no, I, I want to know, um, know about your journey in a nutshell and how because you, you studied naturopathic medicine and Chinese medicine, and I think you're very much seen as a master of both hmm, over all the, after all of these years. <laughs> well, okay. Well, I guess I started, I first heard about naturopathy from Dr. Christopher. Met in 20, must have been, no, 1970 five or something like that mm. or four around that time so who, who was dr. dr christopher dr christopher john christopher was dr bastier's teacher okay and he went around the united states he was a mormon mm. um naturopathic doctor and chiropractor too because that at that time they were together and he went around and talked to groups of people and this was at rainbow gatherings and i went to one and i was blown away by, oh, this is the kind of doctor I want to be. Hmm. How do I find that? And I didn't know there was any naturopathic schools at the time. I didn't know where they were. So I ended up um, hearing about an acupuncture school and went out to Boston to study with Dr. So and, and um, ended up teaching there and working with a group of us uh, started a hospital program that was kind of the model for, I think, what our medicine should be. So we had psychologists and nutritionists and acupuncturists and MDs and all kinds of different modalities, massage therapists. We all worked together on the same patients and I, it was remarkable. And um, so that was among my first patients that I saw. And then gradually I you know, was teaching point location and pulse diagnosis and all kinds of things like that. And the naturopathic school called our school and said, anybody want to come out to the West Coast and start an acupuncture program? And they said, Satya, <laughs> Dr. So said, Satya, you want to go start a program? And I said, okay. And so I ended up coming out here and starting the acupuncture school. And then I went, oh, this is naturopathy. Oh my gosh, this is what I always wanted to do. That was OCOM. That, and so I founded OCOM and started going to school at the same time. So I went through the program. Founded OCOM and started the naturopathic program. Yeah, at the same time. Yeah. And it was like, uh, you know, I was kind of hyperactive and it got me over that. <laughs> you were, <laughs> say more about that. What do you mean? I just had hyperactive? so much energy. I was 20, let's see, 27, oh. 28. And just like had so much energy. Yeah. And was just like, well, I, well, I got into medicine because I wanted to change the way things had happened in my life. My mom was put on, she was given surgery and then put on pain meds and it never worked mm -hmm. at, for a broken back. And um, so I just felt like we were missing something and, and then she died in a car accident because of the pain meds. Oh no, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. It, was, it was a tragedy. She's an amazing woman. Yeah. And so I just felt like we need to be doing some things radically different. And I still feel that way. I just feel like the medical doctors are restricted somewhat by some of the, the science-based medicine, the evidence-based medicine is really good, and they can't do anything outside of a certain scope. And so their creativity and brilliance is, is stunted a bit. Yeah, and they're working within a really closed container. Yeah. And, and I respect that container, and it's amazing it's at saving lives. I mean... Right. Yeah, <laughs> it's amazing. So you were touched um, by the conventional system with your mother, it sounds like, really deeply, and that inspired a lot of 
your movement in the natural medicine yeah, world. Yeah. And um, so when was when did your mother pass away? She, I was 23. Oh, wow. So I was, I don't know. I don't even remember what year it was. It <laughs> was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's amazing. I mean, it seems like you know, with pain medications being such a huge issue still, yeah. maybe more so, yeah. you know, it's like, wow, has anything changed? You know, it seems like it's gotten worse. <laughs> yeah. Could you tell a little bit more about your perspective about where we are today in the whole world of medicine yeah. compared to a thousand years ago when you're, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. A thousand um, years ago. It was different. It was 30 years ago yeah. or whenever it was. I guess it was like 45 40. years, 50 years ago. I don't know. <laughs> How old was I? I was 23. Anyway, it was 45 years ago. And um, so pain is still like a really big player. So uh, I got books on acupuncture, and acupuncture is so great for pain. But it doesn't work all the time. And naturopathy really focuses on underlying causes of pain and so that's that's really important like diet and exercise and all those kinds of things and that's also incorporated into oriental medicine so oriental medicine and naturopathy are very similar they just have slightly different modalities that they use naturopathy is more herbal and some hands-on but but chinese medicine has that too um, and we can handle a lot of different kinds of pain, but the pain medications have like, you know what, we have, we have opiates and we have um, like things like baclofen, muscle relaxants, we have gabapentin. I don't see them really working that well for most of my pain patients. Yeah, it's, it's, it almost feels like pain is evolving. Yeah. To, it's like a bacterial resistance infection you know the bacteria gets smarter yeah. and evolves it's like pain is evolving well I'm not, I think we've had pain ever since right but you it's know? it's where it's kind it of worse? these pathways there's so many pain pathways and it's so complicated more, yeah, that's that's true I think we have a lot more inflammation and so yeah. that could be part of it because because of diet and toxicity and stress and all the things, EMFs, you know, there's all kinds of different things that yeah. increase our inflammatory cascade. Yeah, that's a really good point. The world today is so different than the world yeah. 20 years ago, 50 years ago. You so know, therefore, main, pain is different. Yeah. Our main tox, tox, toxic things back then were like the chlorinated pesticides. And um, we had synthetic estrogens, like DES, stuff like that. But there weren't that many... And, like vaccines, there weren't that many vaccines yet. There were a lot of things that we didn't have. We didn't have genetic modification that some of the foods and chemicals that were connected to mm. that. Um, there, were, uh, there were pesticides. There, there have were been some pesticides. Pesticides yeah. and, you know, the chemical warfare and yeah. that sort of era had, you know, oh. had a, a happened. So, yeah. yeah, I feel like we're kind of on the, the back slope of all of that. I don't we're know if it's second generation in. Because right. the first generation, it didn't affect as much. You know how when pesticides um, are contaminating uh, a mom, she doesn't get the symptoms, but her daughter does. And then her grandchildren see it more. Right. Yeah. So tell us more about this intergenerational so that's, toxic That's pass pretty down. scary. I yeah. mean, because it, it changes the genetic expression. The genes don't change, but it changes the epigenetics. And so, um, for instance, okay, the, um, oh, what was it, the body mice? Do you know about them? They, they were exposed mm. to PCBs. Mm -hmm. The moms, the pregnant mouse moms were exposed to PCBs. And if they were given um, pretty high doses of methylated vitamins, choline, that kind of thing, they wouldn't show diabetes and heart disease and birth defects, basically. Um, but if they didn't get the vitamins, the high nutrient levels, they would become diabetic and have heart disease, and they they were obese. Hmm. And are you the, the no? It's, it's not the ringing a bell, but the agouti mice. Okay. Oh. I know that there's a lot of examples of that. You know, 
there's because it's there's the nature and then there's the yeah. nurture there's yeah. the genetics and then there's the environmental impact right. the epigenetics there's a lot of it's, studies it's showing like that all intertwined it's yeah. so interesting yeah but you were talking also about this it's kind of really creepy to me to think that the you know when a woman is on the planet she has um and impre- pregnant Mm-hmm. She has a baby in her belly, of course, but the baby also has the next baby. You know, those the genetic material is present for like three generations. Right. Right. Um, because the ovaries are developing in the fetus, right? Right. You know, so and it's so all exposed. It's There's all exposure during that time. So my grandmother made eggs for my mother. <laughs> While she was in utero. Mm -hmm. And so all three of us got exposed. And um, so Joe Pizzarno says that his his grandpa is so smart that he can, and he's like very, very elderly in his 90s, can beat him at chess. And he's smart. Mm -hmm. Dr. Pizzarno is amazing. Yeah. And yeah. that we are, we're affecting ourselves on many levels, the immune system, uh, genetic expression, neurological development, all kinds of things with the toxic load that we're carrying. Yeah, it's and kind of like a, I've heard people talk about it as we're, we're kind of in this big experiment because no one, you know, we haven't, this has never happened before where yeah. we are on this planet with all of these chemicals and pollutants and And we're changing the microbiome. Things. Yeah, so it's very complex and interwoven. <laughs> I want to get go back and um, talk a little bit more about just your background in naturopathic medicine and Chinese medicine, and mm, okay. the you know I'm a, I'm only vaguely familiar with Chinese medicine, having studied at a school that also teaches a Chinese medicine program, but. I, I want to know about how those two, because I see them as totally different worlds, like oh, really? different universes, the way that some of my friends who are Chinese medicine practitioners talk about the body and the system. It's kind of, huh. I mean, you obviously have an, a, a knowledge and background that kind of overlays them both on mm-hmm. top of one another. So could you talk a little bit about how okay. their similarities and how they work together kind of in your mind and also clinically, practically? So you know how, um, okay, the, the Ne Ching is an anx- ancient textbook, probably the oldest textbook. And they say there's three levels of physician in there. And one treats the symptoms, one treats the symptoms and the cause, and the, the highest level teaches wellness. Mm-hmm. And that's what naturopathy is, it's about teaching wellness. So mm-hmm. there's totally an overlap. But we also treat the symptoms. Someone comes in for a headache, we address their symptoms, hopefully. Mm-hmm. It's sometimes hard to do. I just had somebody, she had terrible headaches for the longest time and she went to all these different doctors. Finally, she went to a neurologist and said, go off your birth control pills and her headaches went away. Way to go, neurologist. I know, I was like. Doing the work of a naturopath. Great. Yeah, <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> um, so, and you know, treating, so that was a cause. Um, part of her cause too is she probably didn't break down birth control pills. Mm-hmm. She probably Liver had a cytochrome P four fifty one B one deletion or something, you know, in her detox pathways. Um, and so, but it, but he didn't teach her the next level, which is what do we need to be healthy and what as an individual does she need to be healthy, and that's exercise and diet and love and doing the things that you really, really um, are excited about, like all the things that keep us healthy. And it's a circle kind of of things around us. And that's what naturopathy does. It teaches us that. And it, you know, if you get a viral infection, you look at, okay, how do you treat the virus? Yeah, natural remedies. Yeah, how do you keep from getting it again? Yeah. And, um, you know, that takes years (laughs) to, to figure that out for a person. And so that's built into the oriental medicine system. Their modal- modalities are include acupuncture and naturopathy doesn't exactly include that. Some people include it. Um, but naturopathic medicine has like all these different things that we can do. We can do herbs and homeopathy. So they're, mm-hmm. that's, they're different herbs 
but they overlap like we use a lot of ginger in mm -hmm. naturopathic medicine and oriental medicine that's a mainstay mm -hmm. and so there's overlapping herbs and then there's different ones mm -hmm. they like the in oriental medicine they really have the steroidal herbs down nicely so they treat what's called yin deficiency and that concept isn't it's too well known in naturopathy but it's kind of cool like if somebody's got hot flashes and has all the deficiency symptoms of estrogen in oriental medicine we would give them steroidal saponins mm -hmm. and you know that's what's in yams and mm -hmm. in an herb called rumania are you familiar mm -hmm. with? yeah mm -hmm. so neat one in um, oh boy, the licorice has steroidal saponins, and there's all kinds of different chemicals that that moisten and build the yin, and so that's a difference that I see in oriental medicine. But we use those somewhat in naturopathy, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's quite as well developed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it sounds like the modalities do kind of overlap. Of besides, yeah. of course, acupuncture. But um, what about just the you know I think because of the, the systems, the meridians, the... And that's um, different, yeah. You know, the, the body, because there's no organs really in Chinese medicine, right? The organs well, are, are not really organs? Well, or that's could you true. Tell, talk about that? Well, they, um, that whole system, I believe, came out of the Confucian era, where they believed that in a, like, we are models of our environment and the environment's a model of us. So in a city, there'd be a place for the grains and there'd be a place for the waterways and there'd be a place for waste, you know? And so that, that was all set up and it would be roads and rivers and things like that. So they, the body had the same modeling. And um, so that was a concept that developed meridians and sure enough they found that there were lines of energy and if you touched on the leg somewhere it would affect the stomach and that whole air line that went up to the stomach would affect stomach function increase you know digestion or stop mm -hmm. stomach pain or something like that and so the meridian system is um is fairly well developed and that's that's pretty different than naturopathy mm -hmm. it's that's a pretty interesting concept it's that totally idea. interesting. Yeah. So where did it, who had the download? I think it was Confucius. Okay. At least he, he gets the credit for it. Uh -huh. But then, you know, you know how um, Edison got the credit for the light bulb, but uh -huh. there's a lot of different sure. things that went into creating that. Yeah, it's really interesting it how his whole, history kind of right, like focused looks at on one Edison thing. And the light bulb. So um, it, it was a conglomerate of all these different people's inventions and, and they fit into a model framework of this. It's basically a medical model, and it, it works pretty well. And um, mm -hmm. I um, am a bit more, oh, not more, I enjoy the naturopathic model because it's, it's more something that um, people in our culture and on the Western culture can relate to. You know, and so I like them to be able to understand what's going on. And if you do something that's Chinese, they can't really get. It's Chinese. Yeah, they. It's it's a foreign concept. The yeah. idea, oh, you're yin deficient, or you have deficiency in your lungs, or liver spleen, you know, disharmony, or, you know, that doesn't make sense. But if you say, oh, your stress is causing digestive problems, yeah. that's. Yeah, that makes that's the more language sense. that I speak. That's, right. I, I think right. that works better in our culture. Yeah. And, and so these are the things I want you to do for your stress. I want you to exercise. You go to bed at night, um, eat these foods, mm -hmm. you know, and take, take mm -hmm. this because it helps reduce mm -hmm. the amount of firing in your brain, like lemon mm -hmm. balm or something like that. Or yeah. So <laughs> at, from my naturopathic background, I'm really in love with the basic most you know the simple things that you yeah. talked about the diet the love the exercise yeah. the sleep and just kind of the lifestyle basics and in your experience um i'm always curious about how acupuncture can acupuncture um take the place of those kind of things i guess no <laughs> if if those things aren't in place, acupuncture doesn't work. Yeah, that's kind of my question. That, it's it's kind of like homeopathy. If someone's not eating well, homeopathy is not nearly as powerful. Yeah. Or um, you know, it's it's kind of 
you have to have those basic things in place that, you know, fairly good diet and eating well. And, yeah, you know, if you injure yourself and there's like a muscle strain or pain, acupuncture is really pretty good for that most of the time mm -hmm. um, if you're healthy. Sure, if you've got the foundation work. in yeah. place. If you don't have serotonin in your system, you can't absorb tryptophan and make serotonin. That pathway is not working, then it won't work for you. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be sort of healthy and strong. If somebody is healthy and strong, acupuncture works right away. I just treated somebody who, he was in a car accident. His dad was in a car accident. His dad's really unhealthy. He's addicted to pain meds. He's had multiple accidents and all kinds of things. And the kid saw that and he said, I'm never going to do that. And he takes really good care of himself. Mm -hmm. And um, his accident was terrible. He had a liver laceration, all kinds of sta stuff happened. And he was better very, very quickly with just mm -hmm. acupuncture mm -hmm. and some chiropractic, some manipulation. But his dad is still in pain and he doesn't eat as well. I mean, it's it's just, it's like treating yeah. two very, very different species. Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> it's very fascinating. Um, yeah, it reminds me, I just, a few, maybe a month ago now, I burnt myself pretty bad, and it was like, you know, totally blistered, and it healed. I mean, I this it looked that like this. Great. Yeah. It looked like this, like, within a week or 10 days, it was just... That's pretty amazing. You know, um, but I hear it all the time, you know, people with diabetes or chronic diseases, you know, they don't heal. And, and those are things that I feel like we're really adept at mm -hmm. in nat natural medicine, naturopathic medicine. Acupuncture, it helps, and it's part of a whole system. And that whole system in oriental medicine is not that different than naturopathy, I don't think. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's different words and different theories and models, you know, of therapeutics, but it's it has some very basic similarities, too. Mm -hmm. oh. Cool. Yeah, um, well, I'd love to hear about some of your hero patients over the years, some that stick out mm. wi with your um, magical wizardry, <laughs> blending the arts as you do. Mm. Um, you know, I have kind of a pattern mm. that I think is very simple, Th that the way I approach mm. um, problems. And the first thing I do if somebody's having a chronic illness is I treat their gut. And so I had a patient um, many, many years ago who kept getting intussusception and then she'd get a volvula. So intussusception is the intestines um, telescoping mm -hmm. in on itself because of severe spasming. And um, so I was an acupuncturist at that time, and I did acupuncture on her, and it would untwist her intestines, and she wouldn't have to get that section of intestines removed. So it was, it was cool. Well, like, yeah. Acupuncture is neat. I was like, wow, oh this is really cool. And we actually did B12 shots into the area because it was stronger than just acupuncture by itself. So I was like, wow. And we tried different herbs, and she was allergic to everything. So she had kind of a small intestine bacterial overgrowth, but I didn't know that at that time because it was... 35, 40 years ago, Before something like that. Before that kind of concept existed. You're right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I worked with her for a long time. She had migraines, and I worked with her migraines and did acupuncture, and she was just um, coming to the age when her eyes were starting to shift and she was starting to get presbyopia. And with treating her migraines, I was doing acupuncture points around her eyes. She never needed glasses. Wow. She was just starting to have to get glasses she's thinking about it and then she would say can you do those points up here even when she didn't have a headache there and her her vision would instantly clear hmm. and I was like oh gosh you know I, I remember this so clearly I, I thought I'm gonna do this when I start needing glasses but I never had time so I ended up getting reading glasses dang it um, so then and she was having heart palpitations because she wasn't absorbing things and it wasn't till a, a year or two later um, that I finally coaxed her into doing a stool analysis. I hadn't learned about that when I first started treating her because I was doing primarily acupuncture. And then I, ha meanwhile, had graduated from the naturopathic school and coaxed her into doing it. And she had tapeworms. That'll mess, I know. That'll mess things up. Yeah, yeah. Huh? yeah. So, so I was like, oh, 
that's causing it. And so she went to her gastroenterologist because I wanted to give her drugs for tapeworms. And um, he said I was crazy. She, that she, she couldn't have tapeworms. But, but she had tapeworms. And, um, and so finally we treated it. And her gut got better. But what really, really helped her um, heal her gut was noni. Noni um, made it so that she could eat more than just tuna fish and garbanzo beans. That's all she could keep down without, like if she ate corn, her intestines would close up and she'd have terrible cramping and um, sh she'd get a migraine that she'd spend a few days in a dark room throwing mm -hmm. up or gluten or, you know, all the mm -hmm. allergic foods. And so she ate noni and it healed her gut enough and kind of cleared her abnormal flora enough so that um, she got better. And um, her migraines, her vision, her heart palpitations, which she was having from the, from the abnormal absorption, everything got better and she stopped intussuscepting. So she stopped having volvulus. Mm -hmm. um. Fascinating. <laughs> I'm curious, do you remember how she changed on kind of the, the mental sphere or? Did she, like, when I think of someone having, um, you know, spasms in the gut, I think of anxiety and I, I think of kind of like, like stress. She's pretty mellow. Okay. Oh, she's a, like an amazing human being to me. She's mm -hmm. one of the sweetest. And, and I, she would have a closed, you know, an acute abdomen. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, well, you know, I, I think you better go to, the, you have a fever, you have rebound tenderness. I think you better to go, go to the ER. And she'd say, well... I, I think I'd rather die. I was going, well, that is kind of the option here. <laughs> and, yeah. Yeah, and, and so I, and I'd say, okay, I'll do a little bit of acupuncture. If it's not better, will you go to the emergency room? And she'd go, no. <laughs> and, wow, one and of those. I know. It was like, oh, that, that kind of thing that you really shouldn't do in the yeah. office. And then, oh, the other thing that really worked for her is I'd give her um, homeopathics. And I didn't really believe in them at the time. But I was, I was desperate. So I gave her Belladonna, and man, that was amazing how much that made her feel better. Mm -hmm. Nat Mira for her headache. She, I learned all about homeopathy through her because she responded so well. Wow. Um, when she was throwing up in a dark room with a migraine, um, and she was, she was very thirsty. Was she thirsty? Um, Brionia, Brionia worked. It was like this amazing cases came out oh, with her yeah. and um and worked and so you know but the, the end of the story is of course it sounds like healing the gut and resolving yeah the, these yeah. cyclic chronic and, things you know she can eat most everything yeah you know? I mean, she's she doesn't eat a lot of gluten she she eats um kind of carefully but yeah. um she's she's doing pretty well yeah well i think in our world today we kind of have to eat carefully because most of the food is yeah, not toxic. really food. <laughs> you know, we need to choose the food substances oh. the best chances we get. Yeah, it's so sad. Yeah, huh. that's a good one. That is a good one. Yeah, I, and she's like, I consider her one of my best friends. Every once in a while, she comes in. She was there there the day I went in labor, and I, you know, I had really great mm. pregnancies in labor and. She's, she said I was in labor, and I said, oh, that, that's, I think those are just practice contractions. She said, I've been timing those. Those are really regular. <laughs> so she helped me get home to have the baby. That, that's nice of her. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's giving you a little payback. She's a, she's a friend of the family. Nice. Um, another patient I had that was really interesting. Oh, I've had, um, I had a little girl that had really severe Lyme disease, and she... Um, um, we're doing a, a course of miracle cases um, in the fall. I think that's when we're going to do the seminar series. Oh, wow. That'll and be cool. um, yeah, I think that'll be fun. Try and get everybody to bring their, when they really did the best. And we should probably do um, the worst cases too, <laughs> which is hard, is really hard to do. It's yeah. really easy to present, oh, this is what I did yeah. right. Yeah. And when I did it's it, it's usually wrong, what we hear. Yeah. Is, and, yeah. And when you say, oh, this is what I did wrong, uh, that's like hard to get people to talk about. But that's kind of it's, when we learn. It's really important. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, this little girl had, um, she got bit by a tick, and it was in summertime. And the doctor, the MD that she went to, didn't think she got Lyme, 
Because she didn't get a really good bullseye rash. She just had like a little speck on her skin. And then she um, stopped being able to walk. And she um, had headaches and stomach aches and weakness. Oh gosh, yeah. And and this was kind of in, in an acute phase kind of thing? Yeah, or? but it just went on. Yeah, okay. Like, and so then when she came to see me, it was about four or five months later. And she, and she had kind of juvenile rheumatoid arthritis symptoms. And um, she was all swollen and puffy and in pain. And, oh, she's so sweet. I love this little girl. And um, so we just used some very simple herbs. I could have done amoxicillin. You know, that's, like, okay for kids because it doesn't mess up the teeth. But I used cat's claw and teasel. Teasel's really good for headaches and brain problems. It, in Chinese, it's called uh, shuduan. It fixes what's broken. And um, teasel's a great herb. Anyway, and the roots are amazing. And um, she gradually, like, each week, she'd, you know, when she'd come in to visit, she'd be a little bit better. And uh, she, re- she responded really well to acupuncture, and kids are really sensitive. And what I'd do is I'd take a little paintbrush, because I didn't actually needle her. Mm-hmm. I'd take a paintbrush and paint her acupuncture points. Because you can just gently touch them, and it wow. changes. Wow, and so not even pressure. Yeah, and so her yeah. headaches would go away, and it was like, it, that was very magical. Hmm. Like, sounds like it. It sounds like a magic wand. I know, like, I know. It's like a magic wand thing. And I'm like, I can't believe this is working. But with kids, they're so sensitive that often, you know, you can do very, very hmm. subtle um, stuff with them, and they, they'll they get better, and their, their pain will get better. But something like Lyme disease, you can't treat without doing um herbs i don't think and you mean without treating the infection yeah without treating the infection yeah so um you know and before i treat lyme i always check the gut flora because um the herbs don't work if you have like bad bugs so you have to get rid of those first and then <laughs> go from there which is also with the herbs though right yeah I mean, with yeah. like a different set of herbs maybe um well yeah it kind of depends. depends yeah Depends on what mm-hmm. people have. If they have bacteria, Oregon grape often works, or plant tannins, or and uva ursi. Those are three of the top. Um, mm-hmm. Berberine is great. Oregon grape. Mm-hmm. Um, so and I'll use Paragard if they've got amoebas. That works pretty well. For a, for a kid though, um, we put her on some rounds of biocidin which is a mixture of a bunch of herbs. It looks yeah. like a black sledge. Have you seen it before? Yeah, well, I've, yeah. I've heard of it being used. Yeah, <laughs> haven't seen like, it, haven't taken it, no. There's a, a, a spray, and it doesn't taste too bad, and so you can use that for kids, and it'll kill, kill blastocystis and, and to me, but like histolytica, mm. the amoebas and things like that. So, but she, uh, it took about seven, eight months, and then she... She's walking fine and not having any symptoms anymore. And she didn't want to go to school. She didn't want to go to gymnastics, which she used to love before she got the bite. And um, I think she's eight now. She was six when we first started seeing her. She's doing really well. So just herbs. Yeah, yeah. We just didn't straightforward. Do just yeah. She's walking again. Yeah. That's. I mean, that's got to be really scary as a uh-huh. six-year-old, kind of yeah. debilitating. Well, she just kind of declined, and her parents were freaking out, and would take yeah. her to the docs, and they wouldn't have anything to give her. Really, they. Yeah. They didn't. Um, well, they didn't really believe in Lyme disease in this area. Uh-huh. Um, that that's a problem, uh-huh. but it is. It is. <laughs> <There's> yeah. <laughs> it's not as bit as prevalent as it is on the East Coast, but uh-huh. it's. Uh, pretty prevalent, you know. Do you, do you think that in our world today, kind of a tangent a little bit, do you think that Lyme disease is becoming overdiagnosed? Or do you think that it's still... Because it's hard I, to tell. Because I know that it's becoming popular. Yeah. And there's and a lot of the tests are indecisive hmm. and like... Or, that testing's terrible. Yeah. Um, overdiagnosed? Underdiagn- I think it's probably more underdiagnosed by one group of people and overdiagnosed by another group yeah, of people. Yeah, it depends on what doctor you go to. I, right, right, yeah. Because a lot of people jump, right. it seems like, like oh they jump gosh, right to it. Oh my gosh, it's going to be Lyme. Yeah. But it could be all kinds of different things yeah. if someone has a chronic illness. Yeah, um, but the, the interesting thing that I find about a lot of the, you know, naturopathic treatments for these kind of conditions, 
you're treating Lyme, but you're also treating a lot of things. So sometimes it works regardless. So it's like right. it doesn't really matter what's going right. on. We just fix everything, do an overhaul. Yeah. We're Except better. with Lyme, I'm pretty aggressive. Okay. If yeah. I if I think that's what the problem is, and it is, it's hard to diagnose. You know, the antibody testing is poor. Mm. The PCR testing is better, but it's hard to get a positive from you know DNA, RNA, and uh, it's too bad. We we there's actually a good research program going on right now. I forget where it is, but um, where they're doing various variables and looking at different options to try to make it more of a definitive test <laughs> yeah, like yeah. black and white kind of yeah. <laughs> that would that would be nice that, yeah. so, so you know like right now if someone has strep you can do a strep culture and then you know you're dealing with strep yeah and you can either treat that herbally or with antibiotics both mm-hmm. of them will work because there's lots of strep killing herbs like mm-hmm. garlic for, and berberine oregon mm-hmm. grape but um with lime you can't you can't have that definitive like it's not a 90 what, 9% mm-hmm. effective mm-hmm. diagnostic rate. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of <laughs> frustrating. Yeah, it's maybe 50%. Oh, if wow. You ha- if you have a positive, that you'll get a positive test. Wow, I didn't know it was that it's, kind of yeah, nebulous. That's, that's not good. Yeah. So that's too bad. Yeah. All right, well, is there maybe one more case that uh, is worth sharing? Um, did I tell you about my uh, patient who had lung collapse? Lung collapse? <laughs> she had atelectasis. No. Okay. From an accident? or? Um, no. No, it's oh. interesting. So All the right. most common um, atelectasis, I found this out. Like, I read about this in school, and it didn't make sense until I actually saw a patient with it. Because um, I didn't think, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to see someone with lung collapse. Anyway, so she, um, it usually happens in tall, slim guys okay. your age. Yeah, like... Isn't it associated with Marfan's? And oh, it can be, yeah. or asthma. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. Ath- and tall, skinny, athlete, athletic men get mm-hmm. it. And she was a 50-year-old female. <laughs> but Not she's a, tall, yeah. yeah. She's tall, and she, did, she had um, a little bit of asthma. And she flew to Vermont, and then on the way back, she got a lung collapse in the airplane. So the change in pressures huh. caused a problem. And so um, she went to the hospital, they reinflated her lung, and then uh, a day or two later it collapsed again. And so she kept having troubles. And I forget what I had seen her for. I saw her for, uh, I don't know. Um, but she came and said, you know, I, we got to stop this. They just put talc into my lungs to see if they could keep them from, like, um, collapsing. Um, then the next thing was to open up her lungs and it, it was as a hard surgery, it's hard recovery, and uh, fatality is not uncommon. And she didn't want to do that, <laughs> so I don't blame her. Mm. And so I looked up atelectasis and, um, on the Internet and um, found that, gee, it's um, because someone doesn't have enough surfactant. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and so then I, I Googled uh, surfactant, and it's made out of glutathione and choline. Wow. I, yeah, I didn't know that. I know. Isn't yeah. that interesting? Yeah. And so I said, well, let's try. I had <laughs> glutathione, glutathione choline. and give her choline and glutathione. And she never got another lung collapse again. Just one infusion? or was uh, it I started giving her, I gave her um, glutathione. Like it was oh, a liposomal yeah. liquid, like tastes like fish smoothie. Yeah, gross I would imagine. Sort of thing, but, but yeah. she's like totally into it taken it yeah whatever works yeah Jeez. and but she also she also tested positive for Lyme disease so that was kind of a tipping point she had some lung issues and then Lyme disease was an inflammatory factor so we treated her for that too mm-hmm. and uh, she never wanted to go off the treatment for Lyme disease because she thought and I think I made her do it a while ago because she was she came in a few years later and she was still on the Lyme treatment and she didn't have any symptoms and I said I think that you don't need those anymore huh. but she found she didn't get colds she didn't get lung stuff because the Lyme treatment with cat's claw or cemento um, increases natural killer cells so anyway she's <laughs> she's she's doing really well she thinks that I can figure out anything uh, the yeah, did, did, <laughs> that's amazing. Did you see any <laughs> any other cases being treated with such no. treatment? No. It sounds like something that should be published I just, or I know we should or, we should write it up or yeah. or do a study. 
yeah. or something like anybody that has atelectasis. I have one patient right now, but since then I never saw any other atelectasis patients. Um, and I have somebody right now who has a little bit, part of their lungs collapsed. Um, hmm. So I'll have to think about if that's... <laughs> but Super but now, now yeah. what I do is I'll do a nutrient test and if people are low in glutathione and choline, you know, I'll give that to them. Mm-hmm. Um, just kind of interesting that we can we can do that we can do nutrient testing Mm -hmm. and gi testing and um so the the docs across the street at the medical office they they're all mds and they send patients over they say we can't do those cool tests that satya can do so go have her like diagnose you and we'll help her treat you know you're like your insurance will pay us but they won't pay her (laughs) Well, that's, I mean, it seems like that's a step in the right direction. Yeah, that's in kind a of a miracle, of too. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and I send people over to them. Oh, they're great. You know, they'll, yeah, wow. they won't, like, tell you you're crazy. Cool. <laughs> I would love to use that as a way to kind of shift into another topic, which is how is, from your perspective, medicine today compared to when you started practicing? Oh, you my know, gosh. Where, how do you feel like it's things are? so different. Like, yeah. people are so open to I mean, we, Yeah, we talked about medicine. kind of the state of the environment kind of yeah. going in one direction. Yeah. But what about the state of medicine? Um, okay, well, there's still lots of problems. Yeah. But we didn't used to be covered by insurance. Everything was um, cash. And um, what else is so different? I mean... Um, well, the collaboration sort of thing. Yeah, that, we, when did that kind of start happening in your world? Just a few years ago. Uh-huh. I mean, it seems like that uh-huh. was relatively recent. Now I have, like, I have an oncologist. I call up and say, hey, this patient won't do chemotherapy. Will you track them for me? And he will. Wow. And, yeah. you know, so he'll do ultrasound and watch, you know, the if, the, if what we're doing works for the breast cancer or whatever we're treating. And... Um, you know, and he calls me back, and, and when something happens, he says, what'd you do? And I say, why? And he says, well, there's no more lesions in the liver now. With one person I gave Halen to, have you ever heard of that? She had colon cancer with METs to the liver, and there were some spots in her lungs, too. Halen. Halen. It's a soy, it's a beverage. It looks like a mocha lata. Okay, is, is it it's, um it's a it's a fermented soy it's like a natto kind of thing yeah it's kind of like natto uh-huh. um it tastes really awful uh-huh. and um anyway so he said what'd you do you know this this like her ca125 or ca19 whatever cancer marker was positive on her went down you know from 300 to 40 into normal range and um her wow. spot her spots went away and she refused to do chemo and stuff like that um, so, so, so I, I became a big, big advocate of Halen, but getting people to take it is really hard. I'm allergic to it. Dang it. Is it, it it's really expensive as well. Yeah, it's right? like, it's like $70 a bottle and you need like to take at least a case and a case is 20 bottles. But I, I mean, that yeah. sounds expensive because we're paying but it out of our, therapy oh costs man, a lot tens more. of thousands of dollars. Yeah. Yeah. yeah one shot, you know, yeah. like, oh, you know that woman, um, she came back and they wanted her, they said, um, with an ulcerative colitis recently. I hadn't seen her in like 10 years or something. And uh, they wanted to give her Humira. Hmm. And um, she couldn't afford it because it was $1,500. Her copay was $1,500 a month. Oh my gosh. Which was like their, what they lived on. And um, so. So I gave her C-Cure, I gave her stuff to calm her system down, and um, we'll see what happens. Anyway, so <laughs> I kind of got... <laughs> yeah, but... Um, okay, the, the whole thing with docs, um, they're very respectful. They used to be very, very disrespectful. Yeah, well, do you, I mean, we're in Oregon, you know, we're kind of in That's true. That, like this kind of bubble. We're in America, bubble. Uh, yeah, bubble. Rainbows um. and unicorns. <laughs> <laughs> Rainbows, unicorns, and naturopaths. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, from from your perspective, I mean, things are shifting in general yeah. outside of Oregon as well. Do you? I mean, what what do you feel? Oh, like Dale Bredesen's work. Do you know him? Yeah, the Alzheimer's. Yeah, yeah, yeah the Alzheimer's. I mean, he like says there's 36 different causes of Alzheimer's. Like that's something that 
naturopaths have been saying there's lots of different causes of diseases and you have to address address them all yeah and he's like he's got this whole protocol it's great mm -hmm. and it's using naturopathic stuff totally I, yeah and there's obviously <laughs> functional medi you know functional yeah, medicine training functional. for match for mds and they're, they're that's naturopaths that are training them yeah, you know, they're, really they're learn, you know, a lot of people ask me about naturopathic medicine versus functional medicine and I mean, I've kind of it's kind of the same yeah, they, minus a little philosophical stuff that yeah. is in the naturopathic yeah. mindset for my, you know, my beliefs at least. Yeah. Um, hmm. but yeah, I think that we are kind of seeing the light, seeing the truth and migrating in that way yeah sort of you know I, there's groups of people that are working really well together and yeah the insurance companies are covering us now mm -hmm. you know and that's really interesting that was never never the case in Oregon in, yeah, yeah that's where the true. rainbows and unicorns are <laughs> and, <nature pass. laughs> and insurance companies huh. um, <laughs> yeah um, what about I know that you are one thing that's really special about you is just the way that you practice kind of in your magical sort of way, but you're also <laughs> like have your head in the science all of the time. Oh, yeah, I like science. <laughs> um, so what about the direction of science? Like where do you, how do you think that world is? Because, um, you know, we've been kind of going along like this and then it's like going up and it's like, it's this logarithmic explosion of understanding. And um, I think it's absolutely amazing. And we can use it for good. Mm -hmm. and, and it can also be like extremely dangerous. Mm -hmm. Because like EMFs are hard on our bodies and the chemicals in our environment are, you know, that's why we're so, seeing so many autoimmune diseases and cancers. And, you know, so so I think that the technology gives us an in potentially to heal um, a lot of things, including the planet. But you know, we're killing the bees, and we're killing. You know, and there's there's hope for the bees. You know, if we use the stuff from Paul Stamets, the information from him about the mushrooms. Yeah, um, heard about this a they, little bit. They yeah. protect the bees from the toxins, so they mm -hmm. don't die. And, um, but there's so many different technologies that are so damaging to our environment, the um, changing in the oceans. We can't survive that. As, a, as humans can't survive that. But like, will the oxygen in the air comes from our oceans, from the mm -hmm. bacterium there. And, and the whole shift of the microbiome of the ocean is happening. And so I think the technology is really good, but what I love the most I think we're healthiest when we're in like a rainforest and you know like our immune system works better our gut works better our brain works better it's it's so amazing um, that we function so much better out of civilization we're, we're so much healthier mm -hmm. so how are we going to balance the technology and preserve you know what's sort of sacred on the planet and um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, I, I know that I feel so much more alive and vibrant in a lot of ways uh, when I'm in, you know, connected with the nature mm -hmm. in whatever ways. And it's kind of like a no brainer, you know? Yeah. But um, what, on that note, what do you kind of see as the ways that we can? support the world our home how can we be kinder and kind of reverse the health issue on the planet while we're also taking care of ourselves do you you know what comes to mind is we have to reduce our population yeah our population i mean it's kind of naturally hap happening happening yeah. like sperm counts are going down in the cities like mm -hmm. people can't have babies mm -hmm. and um so that's that's huge and how to do that in a way that's humane I mean you can't just say okay one baby per person but that's basically what we need to do is per couple is have have a you know reverse growth of our population 
in order to have enough food and not make the water and air and soil toxic. Mm -hmm. And then how else can we do that? Well, then what do you think? I've, <laughs> I've been really connecting with um, sort of a, a vegan <laughs> movement. Oh, that's um, true. We should all be I mean, I mean, from the perspective of healing the planet, it seems like that would really kind of make a big impact immediately. Um, I know it's like a huge dividing controversial thing. Between the paleos and the vegans? Yeah, the war <laughs> that exists and has been existing. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that's big. Yeah. I think we, we can't keep eating meat the way we are. Yeah, at least... At least with our population. It's like one or the other, yeah, right? Yeah. It's like our population goes down or the cattle population goes down to feed us. It's like, you know, right. I think that we kind of have to make this choice. Yeah. Do we want to continue to gorge ourselves with like three times a day with a serving of what, you know, of meat? Or do we want to choose an alternative for the sake of our human race you know well also you know there's the whole thing that do you know michael gregor yeah yeah so i i i love his work and um you know his whole gist is that as soon as you eat a lot of meat you get more inflammatory cascade and yeah. i've seen that clinically like people that are paleo have so much inflammation mm -hmm. um most of the time you know, a little bit of meat. I like my, Michael Pollan's stuff. Is yeah. He, eat I a mean, little bit of, you know, lots of vegetables and a little bit of meat sometimes. Well, recently he said that, you know, it would make sense to eat maybe two ounces of meat per week. That sounds good. You know, yeah. like that is kind of what would be sustainable on this so, world for this. So on that note, you know, we have this, this organic grass-fed meat on our you know we have yeah. we've had cows and sheep on our farm and and we're we're getting rid of the cows and trying to figure out what are we going to do with the land now that we have you know extra space and um trying to figure out what to grow besides blackberries which you know we're really good Gr at growing blackberries. Grow naturally <laughs> yeah they, take over they'll take over yeah. very readily mm. but um and we don't want to spray them so we're thinking well should we have goats or mm -hmm. you know we, uh, you know, what I've come up with is we just have to go around and pick them out one by one by the roots. Whoa. That's <laughs> just going to take a, yeah, know, a century. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> Maybe we could get some Boy Scouts to help us or something. <laughs> or Girl Scouts. <laughs> yeah. After after the blackberries come, of right. course. Yeah. You know, in a few weeks. <laughs> yeah. Um, we'll wait till fall comes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I like the idea of like fruit forests or food forests, you know, just like, mm. you know, just trees where, you know, you're not necessarily, you know, it's minimally in, you know, <laughs> minimal amounts of work, a lot of more bang for your buck kind of thing where you just kind of plant a tree and reap the benefits rather than going and tilling the earth. And So what trees would you plant? Oh, I don't know. Up here in Oregon, I love fig trees. Oh, yeah. I love apple trees. <laughs> you know, th like gosh you yeah. know the sky's the limit up here in Oregon yeah you know some of um, we were in Hawaii a little while ago and we we were talking to someone who had lived there and someone had thrown a watermelon out you know and into the forest and there were watermelons hanging from oh the gosh. trees there yeah <laughs> and they didn't tell anybody about it they just like all summer they wow. ate these mel they'd go down and eat a watermelon every day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See good. that yeah, that's that's that what I that sounds really good to me. Yeah. Um well on on that note, just kind of like tying things up, what about you and your life? What are some kind of practices or um habits <laughs> that you use to nourish yourself so that you can continue taking care of so many wonderful people on the planet? So I, this is a really important question. Yeah. So what I do every morning is I get up, you know, I try and sleep seven and a half hours, otherwise I can't function. And so I, I have to make myself go to sleep because my mind's always kind of going at night. But I found that if I keep going all night, I can't perform the next day. <laughs> so how do you make yourself go to sleep? I tell myself to shut up. <laughs> in a nice, easy? In a nice way. No, it's like, so I, I'll meditate. Uh -huh. I meditate myself to sleep, mm -hmm. and then um, and then I sauna every morning, 
and I do yoga in the sauna because otherwise um, I have injuries where I, I, I can't move. <laughs> and then I, I shower and I do yoga. And so I do Bikram in the morning, every, mm. but my own version yeah. of it with a few added Right, stretching <laughs> in the sauna sounds good. Lots, yeah. of, lots of hip, hip things and neck stuff. And then um, I walk for a, an hour, hour and a half. Um, Every morning and wow. do kind of intervals. I I run and walk and um, and then I come back and I make a big stir fry for breakfast lunch. I'm an APOE four, so that means I I shouldn't eat quite as frequently. So mm-hmm. every 13, 14 hours, according to Bredesen, I, I mm-hmm. like that, mm-hmm. and I do fine doing that. And so then I'll make um, some food, and uh, my <laughs> breakfast is like I think it's delicious so I do uh, onions and garlic and beets and broccoli and purple cauliflower like as many vegetables as I can get in there mm-hmm. um, greens from the garden um, whatever we happen to have around but that's kind of you know the base and then um, that's my food for the day until um, dinner time I'll have a set have a salad and sometimes I'll have salmon on it um, Sometimes I'll, I usually do beans, um, like a a quarter to a half cup. That made my cholesterol was going up, beans. and and I that that just like went down like so rapidly. It was amazing. Beans yeah. are such a great food. Yeah, I know Michael Gregor loves. Yeah, beans. Yeah, yeah. I was mean. like, oh my goodness. Yeah. So I and Furman too. He says you gotta yeah. you gotta do a little bit of beans, and um, and then I I come to work and I love being here. You know, it's like uh, kind of stressful, but I think I need some challenge. So, and I, it's really important to have people around me that I work well with that are respectful to each other. I can't, I can't have people disrespecting our secretaries, or I, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's so hard. Mm-hmm. People are sometimes um, quite rude. Um, so I'm, I'm working with people that I really enjoy for the most part and um, like, and sometimes there's problems, but. Um, that's okay. We work through them, and then, and my husband's working really hard too. You know him, and I he's do. Yeah. <laughs> he's uh, a great farmer, and he's also a really good surgeon. He likes to fix stuff. <laughs> What's he fixing lately? Uh oh. Um, Hope, hopefully, see, hopefully not too do? much surgery. Oh, he's he does surgery every you know every Wednesday. He yeah. teaches down at the school. You, yeah, I get, okay, and, just yeah. in the clinic, just not on clinic. not on any and family he, members no, or no, animals or anything. Well, like yeah, that. if we so every once in a while we'll have somebody yeah. split something open. My son dropped a knife in his foot, and oh we gosh. we got to uh, fix him up. That was kind of fun. Um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so and a few times a week I go and lift weights. That makes a huge difference. I mean, we have to lift weights like stress our body and then a couple times a week I'll go um, to the for uh, to the deep forest and a couple times a week yeah that's awesome so I have Wednesdays yeah. off sort of I usually yeah. work half a day like mm-hmm. on stuff and then um, yeah and I love mushroom hunting it doesn't matter if we find mushrooms or not mm-hmm. but um, that's that's a good good way to get out there right a good you excuse go. and sometimes you get some gifts yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and so I usually go at, like yesterday I went around Timothy Lake partway and um, uh, it's just this area is so beautiful especially this time of year yeah it's a little <laughs> warm today some yeah, days but, yeah. I haven't but, even yeah. been out yet oh this yeah I think it's like so. 90 oh. but we, we, I'll, we take all get yeah, I'll take it. I'll take it. Yeah. Wow. Well, you really take care of yourself. I, I do. I have to. And, and sometimes eat a little sugar with chocolate. And a little sugar with chocolate? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or a little chocolate with sugar? No, I, I oh. mainly chocolate. <laughs> so, but yeah. I try and get uh, sugar free chocolate, and I have berries every day. Mm-hmm. And, you know, all, all the studies with cognitive function and berries like increase cognitive function 30%. Yeah. So I need that. Yeah, no, I, I love the way that you kind of integrate all these evidence-based practices as just kind of a part of your day-to-day. It, yeah, yeah I think that we really all good. need to kind of, yeah, you know, do and those kind of things. I can't, I, you know, I, six or seven patients a day is 
pretty much what I can do now. Yeah, I used to a see lot. a lot more. And um, so now I'll, I'll work, you know, like I start work at 11 because I have so much stuff to do in the morning. And, you know, there's a few things on the farm usually to take care of. And then uh, finish around five or six. Or mm -hmm. Some days I, a little shorter. I do stuff like this on Thursdays. Cool. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Well, what's next? For, for you in, in your world, besides uh, maybe a fruit forest or something like that. <laughs> I have some choices right now. I, yeah. I, I could retire, and um, that's a plus, and just see my favorite patients, but that doesn't really, um, my goal is to help humanity balance out, and that doesn't really totally meet my goal, because mm -hmm. we have to touch more than just a few people. Yeah. But a few people, you know, if you empower them, that can be pretty powerful, but I feel like we need a hospital or an inpatient facility, um, and so that's an option. But that's a lot of work, and it's it's expensive. And uh, yeah. none of the nature paths I know have tons of money. We don't have fancy cars Not yet. usually. <laughs> Not yet. I, I don't see that in our future. We don't see enough patients. Yeah, I, <laughs> it's it's really interesting how the way of the naturopathic doctor is kind of. There's just a, like a struggle built in, yeah. And I don't, I don't want that to be the case. And yeah. I, I'm really doing my best to choose out of that. But it seems like that has been the way in in yeah. a lot of ways. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, I, I could open an. I, I actually have opened another clinic, and so we have two clinics, and I could keep doing that mm -hmm. and kind of re retire and just mentor people. So that's that would be cool. And I'd like to write and and uh, follow literature. And um, right now I'm working on ALS. I don't know if you've heard of Diana's protocol. Oh, I'm Diana's show protocol. It to you. Oh, cool. It's, it's really amazing. Yeah, I know that you've you, you were talking <laughs> about how you've really gotten into the, the brain stuff, yeah. neurological stuff. Yeah. So that's that's kind of cool. That's like they found that the ketogenic diet didn't really work that well for ALS. Uh, it helped a little bit some people. But if they gave people ketones, it helped reverse the progression of the disease, or you know, stop the decline and sometimes reversed it. Hmm. Um, so alpha ketoglutarate, and so arginine alpha ketoglutarate was the best, and so you can take that, and it really makes a big difference. In ALS, yeah. or and other in ALS and other stuff. Ne other neurological diseases too, hmm. including like seizure disorders, because it. It stops the neuroinflammation so dramatically. The ketones mm. do, and you can take them orally. Mm -hmm. They taste bad, though. So mm -hmm. <laughs> there's always that taste bud thing yeah. we got to get by. There, there is the taste bud thing. <laughs> Just got to make a chocolate bar out of it. Yeah, yeah. It's only <laughs> a little bit of nice. sugar. <laughs> um, cool. Yeah, I mean, you're you, you're staying busy. Yeah, and yeah. I imagine that's also. I mean, it seems like that's also part of what keeps you really on you're you you know you're so sharp and because because you don't you don't you don't allow yourself to get dull it's like you stay you know you stay sharp actively it's like a choice oh, that you're making yeah so I, I study like. I study quite a bit yeah um you know the best way to study right now is YouTubes oh my gosh well this will be on YouTube <laughs> yeah I know it's not funny that's like so weird yeah. um but you know there's Stanford online medical school and there's like Mm -hmm. Atia stuff and Gregor's. Yeah, you know, I, cool. I mean, someone was talking about, I was listening to some podcast or something talking about how nowadays people, the average person has access to like PhD level academia at their fingertips. Right, continuously. And, and so that's like, that's really important because we actually, you know, like Jefferson said, we need to educate people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right. In order to that's where it starts. Yeah, right. Yeah. In order for um, equality, justice, and democracy to happen, people have to be educated. Yeah. Um, you know, the Zunis have a saying um, that's really, uh, you know, when the kids start killing each other, it's time to change what you're doing. <laughs> and, you know, it's not just the kids. It's like there's The, the kids violence. of Earth. Yeah. The, the, yeah. Maybe they, yeah. We, and, we need to change some things. The kids are killing each other and they humans are. on all levels, yeah. All ages. Um, so we, we're in trouble, and so we got to change. And they're, they're toxic. They can't help themselves. And yeah. then they're on meds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's not helping. Well, <laughs> on that note, do you have any kind of 
last words of wisdom mm. for anyone who's um, you know maybe looking towards taking the next step towards their own holistic well-being on any level you know you, you laid out your your day-to-day -day routine but beyond that are there any sort of hmm. grab on takeaways from any Dr. additional Satya? things I think you know we each are here to do something and we have to be healthy to do those things like this is what you're here to do mm -hmm. is you know and you have to take care of yourself in order to do your work yes that thanks for the continual <laughs> reminder and we can't we can't get away with we don't have enough time to not do that we've you know cuz our our, we have limitations on how far we can stretch the planet mm -hmm. and um, that, you know this is the only one we've got at least right now and so we we m probably have time to reverse things although if we don't we've pr only got a few years left and you know Einstein said uh, after the bees are gone we've got four years of mm -hmm. food left mm -hmm. basically because that's it mm -hmm. and um, there's several different things like the oceans are that way and the bees are that way <laughs> and the atmosphere the microbiome is changing because of roundup you know the glyphosate and um, and so on many many levels we need to change all things and each of us has a role you can't do everything but each of us has a role to shift those things and balance it so our children and their children can be have a beautiful place to be here you know and grandbabies are the best mm -hmm. I hate to see anything happen to them mm -hmm. they're so mm -hmm. say you know the humans are so cool like we can change things by thinking about things you know like we can change light according to the physics experiments in France and um, so you know first change your mind and then follow it through um, with action so I don't know. Is that what you meant? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's what I meant, and that's a good one. I uh, I think that I really like that because I you know I didn't directly ask this question, but you answered like what it means to be healthy to me, um, because it's it's not just it's not just having a healthy physical body, but it's like doing something with it. It's it's like expressing your potential into the world for the sake of humanity and the health of the planet and the health of the collective that's true it's um but it yeah, doesn't I, really matter what religion yeah or whether you're a republican or democrat or independent it doesn't matter <laughs> we all need the same things mm -hmm. yeah well okay. that's a good place to end <laughs> take care of ourselves and um Thank you for Thanks. the inspiration and the wisdom, as always. <laughs> and uh, peace and love to all of you and you. Thank you. Yeah. Until Blessings. next time. Blessings. <laughs>